we will kick off. So um, again, thank you to everyone uh, for attending this information session and your interest in our new postgraduate diploma in financial planning. On behalf of myself and LIA, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who is tuning in this afternoon. My name is Eva Lavin and I'm the education manager in LIA. LIA are delighted to be in a position to offer this programme, which is commencing in September of this year. And I hope that this information will, session will provide you with um, a little bit more of an insight into the programme and answer any questions that you might have. So the postgraduate diploma is the gateway to the CFP designation and I will touch um, on this in a few moments but we will also be taking you through an overview of the program and I'm joined here this afternoon by our expert lecturing panel and I would like to thank them for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be here with us today and we'll hear from each of the lecturers shortly and they will provide an overview and an introduction to each of their modules. We are also joined by Bill Hannan, who is our Chief Academic Officer for the programme. So welcome, Bill, as well. You will see at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A box, and I would encourage you all to ask questions as we go along. We will have a Q&A session at the end where we will answer as many questions as we can. And if we don't get around to answering all the questions, we will follow up with you after, after this session. So, the ultimate goal for the vast majority of individuals undertaking this program is to become a certified financial planner professional and obtain the prestigious and internationally recognized CFP designation, which is awarded by the Financial Planning Standards Board Ireland or FBSB Ireland. There are what we call the four E's which are required to satisfy FBSB Ireland certification requirement. They are education, experience, exam and ethics and the postgraduate programme satisfies the education component of FBSB Ireland's certification criteria. Also, our academic uh, partner, IT Sligo, is delighted to be one of only two education providers in Ireland approved by FBSB Ireland, offering a level nine programme which satisfies the education component. So just to give you an overview of the programme itself, there are, the programme consists of six modules. So you can see the, the six modules on screen there. And in terms of commitment, this is a level nine programme. So it is at a master's level. It will challenge you, but bear in mind as well, it has been designed for working professionals so that you can complete your studies um, alongside the day-to-day the -day demands um, of, of your job. Um, modules one to five can be completed in any order, but we would encourage you to um, complete module one first, as this is a good introduction to the program. Module six then, which is the integrated personal financial planning module, is the capstone module. And this module must be completed last um, as it incorporates the learning from the five prior modules. So you, you can't um, enroll for the integrated personal financial planning module unless you have completed um, the first four modules um, or you are enrolled and have completed um, retirement planning as well. In terms of the cost, it's €1,100 per module. So the programme itself is 6600 There is a reduced fee available um, for the retirement planning module. So if you hold LIA's or PA designation, you are entitled to a reduced fee of €550 Euro for, for, for this module. And also, um, you are required to be a member of LIA. So just moving on to the entry requirements to the programme. So there are two, I suppose, entry requirement routes to this programme. The first is if you have a relevant 2-2 honours degree. And what I mean by relevant is that it must be in the areas of business, finance, or a numerate discipline. And a numerate discipline might be physics, maths, or engineering. 
The, the second part then is if you have a relevant professional qualification. And you can see those listed on the right hand side of the screen. Um, if you are entering the course with your QFA, you must have three years relevant work experience as well. And that's work experience within the life assurance industry um, or the financial services and banking. Also, candidates should have um, a good working knowledge of Microsoft Excel before commencing the, the programme. Moving on then just to exemptions. So um, holders of the AITI Charter Tax Advisor qualification qualify for an exemption from the tax and estate planning module. Um, also, students who hold the SIA designation will qualify for an exemption from the investment management module. And all exemption applications can be made directly to LIA. So just to give you a bit of a, an overview and a picture of, of what the programme might look like, as I said um, previously, there are, there are six modules and there are three terms. So there are two modules in each of the terms. If you decide to take this route and you take two modules per term, you will complete the program within 18 months. So students that typically will complete the program within 18 months then will be invited to um, by FBSB Ireland to sit the CFP exam in spring of 2023. You will also see that en route to your diploma, there are two designations that you can get. The first is the SIA designation, which is a Specialist Investment Advisor designation. And then there's the RPA designation, the Retirement Planning Advisor. So it's a great opportunity to obtain two designations en route to your qualification. And as I mentioned previously, students who already hold the SIA designation are exempt from the investment management module. Any LIA students who hold the level seven or PA designation will be required to complete the retirement planning module. And um, as this covers the body of knowledge required by FPSB Ireland to satisfy the education requirements for the CFP designation. But in saying that the knowledge that you have already gained um, will be to your advantage um, and this module will bring it to the next level. And again, just a reminder that if you do hold um, the RPA designation, you are entitled to the reduced fee of 550 euro for the retirement planning uh, module. Again, this is just um, another um, overview if you were to complete the, the program and by just taking uh, one module um, a term, and this is what it would just look like. So if you were to complete one module per term, um, you would complete the program in 36 months. Um, so you will be completing the program at the end of 2024, then with the aim of sitting um, the CFP exam in spring of 2025, if that was the pathway that, that you wanted to, to proceed with. So as part of the diploma, there is an embedded exit award um, available. So for students who decide that they want to cease their studies and don't want to continue and complete the diploma, the level nine postgraduate certificate in business and financial planning um, is available for those students upon completion of the three modules that you see on screen there. So principles and practices of financial planning, investment management and retirement planning. So the, the certificate um, is not an automatic award that's given. It is given to, to students who decide they don't want to continue with the diploma and you have to apply to LIA in order to get this um, exit award. Just then in terms of the, the delivery and the assessment of the programme itself, this course will be delivered predominantly online, but there may be some supporting face-to-face -face lectures, and that might look like one or two face-to-face -face lectures. This gives, I suppose, students the, the freedom of e-learning, but it's also an opportunity to personally interact with your lecturers um, and with fellow students. I suppose for this year, um, as the, the vaccination programme is 
continues to be rolled out, we have made a decision to run all our lectures online this year. So for term one, for the two modules within term one, those lectures will be online only. And I suppose in, in terms of attendance at those lectures, um, we would require a minimum of 75% attendance um, at the, the live lectures. Now, lectures will be recorded, um, but they will form part of your study support so that if you want to refer back to previous lectures, you will be able to view them. But that they don't count towards your um, the 75% the attendance requirements. And I suppose with any level nine programme, students are expected to make themselves available at the scheduled lecture time. In terms of then the assessment piece, so the, the modules are assessed by a mixture of continuous assessment um, and exams. So I'm delighted now to introduce you to the programme faculty. We have um, Paul Grimes, Brian Grimes, uh, John Luby, David Clancy and James Skeen here. And each of our lecturers are industry leaders and practitioners who will bring with them a wealth of knowledge and experience to the programme. And first up is Paul Grimes, who is a certified financial planner. He is CEO of Financial Planning Standards Board Ireland and principal of Grimes International. He has held numerous international leadership positions in the advancement and promotion of financial planning standards. So I'm now going to hand you over to Paul who is going to talk about the first module principles and practices of financial planning and he's also going to introduce you to the other lecturers. So thanks Paul. And, uh, and thank you Eva uh, and good afternoon everybody and, and thanks for taking the time to be with us uh, this afternoon. Um, we, we might jump on one slide there, uh, please. Um, ju just whilst you're having a look at the uh, at the slide there, what I've put up for you is the learning outcomes associated with the with the first module. But but maybe uh, whilst you're reading that, a couple of things I would like to to emphasise um, for you. The first thing is the experience that the lecturers bring to the program. So, so you will see from uh, any detailed bios that you might look at online, we, we are all from practice-based backgrounds. And I think it's fair to say on behalf of all the lecturers, we bring with us an attitude to the program, which is we fully appreciate and recognize that in paying the fees that you're paying, you need to be in a situation where at the end of it, it's not just about the qualification itself, but it's also that you're getting value for your money. And so I, I can guarantee you that pretty much from the first couple of lectures onwards, you will be taking away with you um, uh, new skills and abilities that will make a material difference to how it is that you conduct your your face-to-face -face jobs with clients on a on a daily basis, uh, and that permeates across each of the uh, each of the distinct modules. Extending that into the, the this is a new offering from from LAA, but be assured uh, the the lecturers that you have here are all experienced lecturers. Myself. Brian and David, who you will meet shortly, uh, indeed have been lecturing on the previous iteration of this program uh, for the past 10 years. So, so we are all very experienced in terms of, of not just practice, but in terms of the lecturing of the content and, and driving towards the type of practice standards and professionalism that we're aiming for with the CFP uh, brand. Okay, so... Um, in terms of the, uh, the the first module, a couple of maybe highlights just to draw out for you. Um, you, you there's, a, there's a financial maths component to this module, but what I want to emphasize is um, the, the financial maths is not in of itself the big challenge. Uh, and it's a, a, what, what we tend to do is teach this through the use of a financial calculator. Uh, some of you may have come across such a device. Many of you, I'm imagining, may not have at all. So, so one, of the, uh, one of the new learnings there will be the use of those financial calculators and, and exploring the, uh, the financial maths that underpins the financial planning profession using, using those uh, uh, techniques. Um, very 
early on, we'll start to get into um, an examination of the environment uh, within which financial planning is conducted uh, and be able to appraise some of the challenges that are facing the, prof the growth of the profession, but indeed the larger and wider industry uh, in the short and medium terms, both in Ireland and overseas. And we look to some of the uh, overseas experience in terms of how that might influence developments here uh, in Ireland. So, so that that will form a bedrock of of the uh, of the first module um, and very quickly we will get into the financial planning process uh, and start to explore through some different examples how we set out the financial planning process and how we apply some of the learnings from the uh, from the, the the financial maths and calculator uh, 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 aspect um, it will be very useful if you if you have some knowledge of Microsoft Excel. I, I will touch on uh, I, 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 throughout um, the module. I'll touch on some of the the I suppose the areas of Excel that will be useful to be uh, uh, au fait with. Uh, it's not advanced levels of Excel. I'll, I'll stress. Um, it's rather the uh, the approach to take in terms of how to set out data so that it can be analysed um, reasonably uh, for the purpose of cash flow management and and so on uh, uh, with with module six in mind which I'll speak about uh, quite separately so um, so does the module one in in where it fits within the program it's it's the introductory module for want of a better description it it crosses over and introduces elements that will be explored to far greater detail in each of the other technical modules uh, okay so so that's that's the role that this particular module plays uh, on the program um i i might just maybe uh, before i introduce brian uh, ask you or remind you uh, that we will take questions if um, you might use the Q&A function uh, to just drop any questions that you might have as, as we're speaking and towards the end we will uh, we will deal with the uh, with the questions as we have there. Sorry, I should mention the assessment process. We we I, I will be using a, a process that will uh, examine um, using uh, probably a couple of, of exams throughout the program and then an end of year exam. Uh, that's something that we're just working through at the moment, but that's likely to be my own approach there. Uh, I'm very keen to get people sort of tested very on, early on in the process. There's nothing like a test to sharpen minds and uh, uh, application. So uh, that, that would be my own thinking on that. So, so yeah, that, that's where we're going with, with the first module. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to uh, to uh, Brian Grimes. Brian is head of actuarial function at uh, Intesa San Paolo Life. He is a fellow of the Society of Actuaries and has a career in financial services for greater than uh, uh, 30 years. But but I would I would like to maybe um, also include that I would know Brian for a good number of years and, and Brian would have been central to the formation uh, of a uh, high-end financial planning offering within Bank of Ireland uh, uh, some some years ago. So Brian is is very much at the at the leading edge in terms of that uh, financial planning professional uh, uh, approach. So Brian, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Paul. Um, I said Brian Grimes is my name, um, no relative to Paul, despite very great similarities from both. Um, the, so, so what risk are we talking about? The, the course is, is risk management. Um, <clears throat> we're talking about the risks to people's financial capital, what they have all, already, what they, what they face in terms of investment decisions, behaviour decisions um, at, at retirement. How long does the money have to last? Decisions they make around that, um, and, and then there there is the element of of of, of human capital. And human capital, we mean the money that that they haven't earned yet. You know, the, the, the value of their future earnings, and it, it, that's where we we talk about employment risk. We talk about uh, the, you know the second part of the name of the course, the insurance risk, and and we cover in depth in in depth. Um, approaches to to protecting from 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 death from from um from sickness uh, and so on um so just just moving on to the next slide <clears throat> so when we address that as 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 paul said you know I, i'm an actuary and, and i had a long career in in um product development and and you know, you know the very much uh, design side and product side of, the, of, of things and and we we will of course touch that 
you know we will leave the, the product side of investment and 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 pension to to the other modules but but i i I'll, I'll focus a lot on the on the products that are available on the protection side um and in quantifying the the, the needs that people have um but as Paul said, when, when I moved in my career, when I moved more from the actuarial product side into the, you, you know, with all that, uh, you, you know, smugness that actuaries can have about their, their knowledge, when I came across the sales side, I, I realized that I, I knew by far the least in the room because a big part of the difficulty uh, of, of financial planning and financial advice is matching this knowledge of the maths of the need and, and the nature of products with actually how people think about it, how, how, how your average uh, client th thinks about these things and all the, the flaws in thinking brought around, brought about, you know, that you know, now comes under the, the knowledge of behavioral economics. And I, I guess the, 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 key, the key point I would often start my lectures with is it would be saying to people, you know, okay, we, we have, advice processes set out through the QFA and so on but what if you really want to design your own advice process bring in bring in all these elements together I think that that's that typifies mostly what I'm trying to to to, to deliver in, in in the modules and I think that's where the mastery comes from you know there'll be an academic rigor to the course but but to me the 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 the, the, the real mastery element is is a group of us coming from from different um viewpoints you know with with collective long experience of dealing with customers and and discussing these aspects and and to me you know that here eva talking about the, the 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 importance of the live lectures that that um unfortunately in the current environment the face-to-face -face difficulty is difficult but we'll we'll find ways to engage together and and discuss through these topics and bring the experience of the room together uh that I genuinely hope people will be leaving the module with 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 a real added value in in terms of of of, of their of <coughs> of, of the day to day. Um, the one additional aspect of, of the course that, that I will, I'll also cover is, as as a it's part of the the, the grad dips overall requirement is I, I will also be making a, a an introduction to business accounts. You know, under the idea that as CFPs we we should have an understanding of if we get a set of business accounts, can, can we understand them? And, and we'll cover that as well. So that, that's just a quick uh, summary of, of what we we'll cover and what we're hoping to achieve. Uh, th thanks, thanks very much for that, uh, Brian. Um, the, the next lecturer that I'll introduce you to is uh, John Luby. Uh, John has worked in financial markets since 1990 in various roles spanning fixed income, absolute return and equities. Uh, culminating in his current role of senior portfolio manager with KBI Global Investors. And, and John is very much quoted in, in press. I'm sure many of you will have come across John uh, uh, over the years uh, and is, is published in his own right with a, with a number of books behind him. So, uh, John, uh, I'll, I'll leave you talk about your, your module, please. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just in terms of the the overriding goal of the investment management module is to give you a, a credible and sensible framework to think about financial markets and the challenge of investing. To do that, we're going to cover three broad but clearly related areas. Firstly, we're going to look to build a thorough understanding of the theoretical underpinning of individual assets and crucially how they come together collectively in the context of a portfolio. But investing, as I think Brian has possibly alluded to in his remarks earlier, is not just about static theory. The dynamic reality of investing today across sovereign bond markets, credit markets, stock markets, and alternatives is the second area that we'll focus on. This will involve a range of topics, 
such as valuation, investors' psychology, foreign exchange regimes, the evolution of money, and crucially, on the perspective of today, the monetary policy and fiscal policy backdrop within which we have to operate. And that brings us really to our third area, which is really having to face the reality of effectively zero return from the risk-free asset, what that means, how we've got here, and from an investor perspective, such as yourselves and those you advise, you know, how we should best behave uh, given that reality. So it's a, a broad-based approach, as I say, covering theory and practicality. We cover a fair amount of territory in relation to that. I certainly believe it's material that I find fascinating and have found fascinating for many years, and I certainly hope in the context of the module that you join me in that. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. Um, and to, to the tax and the state planning uh, module and our lecturer here is uh, David Clancy and David is an experienced tax professional with particular exp expertise in the areas of income tax, capital gains tax, capital acquisitions tax and personal financial planning. David himself is, uh, in addition to being a chartered tax advisor, is also a certified financial planner. Uh, he's a member of the uh, Irish Tax Institute, has lectured extens extensively for the Irish Tax Institute and other professional bodies. And David had founded Clancy and Associates back in 1998. So David, I'll hand over to you now. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you know, when, when you look at tax in Ireland, it's a, you know, it's a key area of uh, financial planning. When you look at the tax rates that apply in Ireland, from an income tax point of view, um, you know, you're quickly at 52 or 55. A corporation tax, it can be either 12 and a half, 25 or 40. When you're looking at the capital gains tax rate, when you sell an asset, sometimes it'd be 10, sometimes it would be 33. When you gift an asset or you inherit an asset, typically quickly it's at 33%. And stamp duty is 1%, 2% or 7.5%. So, you know, anybody who is basically operating in this jurisdiction will realize that there's a lot of tax about, okay? And I think in relation to one of the key areas as financial planners, having a knowledge in relation to tax and being able to apply that tax knowledge will give you a fantastic competitive advantage, right? So, you know, it's a key area to, to, to clients where, you know, you've, you, you've got basically someone trying to take 55% of income away, right? So how do we, how do we minimize that? So there's a, a big focus on not only the knowledge, but the application and a big focus in relation to mitigation. How do you basically ensure, basically that you put options in front of clients that will minimize that tax? So some of the things we look at just quickly, we look at the scope of tax, um, you know, people coming into Ireland, people leaving Ireland, we look at that from an income tax, uh, CGT, CAT point of view, we build up a profile around individuals' incomes, and we look at the different types of income. So whether that's, you know, you're operating as a, you know, a self-employed carpenter or um, as a solicitor, uh, or you've got, you know, rental income in, from Marbella, or you've got, you know, interest income or dividends, rental income, which is kind of key to so many, many clients in terms of how, how, how is that assessed to tax? And employment income, which is probably the, the largest part of, of, our, of our Irish income tax code, looking at the tax treatment of everything from salaries to, you know, bonuses, termination payments, share options, etc. So, you know, again, from a CGT point of view, uh, looking at basically, you know, the, the, you know, the scope of the legislation, how you go about calculating capital gains, but most importantly, what are the reliefs there? you know, retirement relief in terms of disposal of businesses or farms, entrepreneur relief where you have a 10% rate on a million of gains. And, you know, 
typically for you know uh, folks when they when they dispose of an important asset, their principal private residence, an exemption in relation to the disposal. Um, so from the CAT point of view, a lot of lot of basically clients looking at that area where you know the the, the tax applies on on gifts and inheritances, and again emphasis on the release. If you're transferring business assets, uh, this business asset relief, um, agricultural assets where agricultural relief, a dwelling house, or utilizing thresholds and exemptions, right? Um, again, a knowledge around trusts, right, in the, and, and, and estate planning in terms of mitigating basically that tax. Um, so, again, you know. We, we look at stamp duty, looking at the difference between transferring assets during lifetime versus transferring them on debt, using corporates more as an operating structure. So realizing basically what the tax implications are of building up basically um, wealth within a corporate, but most importantly, the options in relation to exiting out of a corporate and what are the tax implications, whether you're taken out by salary, by dividends, by liquidating it, by loans from the, the company. So again, just basically seeing seeing from a from a both the corporate and individual point of view, the use of basically uh, a company as an operating structure. So by the end of the course, right, what you're looking to basically these are some of the areas, you know, advising around the scope of Irish tax, residents already residents domicile, people coming in, people leaving, the you know the reliefs that apply in that space, right? The key area of wealth transfer. So clients want to either transfer wealth from one generation to the next, right? What are the implications? If you're selling a business or handing down a business, what are the implications? What operating structure to use from a tax point of view? What are the pluses and the minus? Whether you're operating in sole trader land or you move into company, right? What are the implications? And you know another area which is kind of you know in, in terms of looking at the whole relationship is, issue, right? In terms of you know going from single to married, and what happens if you have the likes of relationship breakdown from a separation, basically divorce, etc. Right? So the key. The keys in relation to the course is, is getting basically knowledge in relation to the tax law and being able to apply it and recognizing opportunities for clients where you can minimize tax based on that uh, knowledge and application. All right, thank you. Terrific stuff, David. Thank you very much. I'm almost tempted to uh, go back and sit in on uh, that, that particular module again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, again, I just remind you, if you have questions, do feel free to use the Q&A function. Uh, I do see there's quite a number coming in, so we, we will deal with those uh, at the end. Um, our next speaker uh, is uh, James Skeen. Uh, James has more than 40 years experience in the pensions industry, uh, was head of pensions with New Ireland Assurance for more than 20 years, uh, and over the course of the previous, or the last 12 years, I should say, has also headed up General Investment Trust, which is the trustee subsidiary company uh, of New Ireland. Um, a a well-regarded voice in the pensions industry. I'm sure any of you out there who are in practice will, will definitely recognize the name. So, uh, James, I'll hand over to you for, for your session, please. Thanks, Paul. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, little did I realize when I joined Irish Life back in 1976 that I was going to spend my whole career in pensions. Um, to me, it's been a fantastic career. I find pensions uh, challenging and interesting. And probably one of the key parts to pensions is there's always change. There's always something new uh, to investigate, to consider and to advise on. Um, I've worked in different insurance companies and different brokers, both indigenous and multinational. And last but not least, I am now in receipt of a pension every month. So I'm a beneficiary of the overall retirement planning system. Um, as you see here from the slide, what I have is I have the client at the center of the universe. And to me, it is all about advising the client, depending on their particular status, um, you know, whether they're self-employed, a company director, an employee, which might be in the private sector or the public sector. And also your client might be an employer or an, in fact, a trustee. And to me, uh, it's crucial, you know, that we conduct a very comprehensive fact find needs analysis um, 
quantifying the retirement needs of the particular client that, that we're dealing with. And, you know, we get under the bonnet of issues such as charges. And the course will give you a very good understanding of how charges work, how to understand the completeness of charges, not just, for instance, the management fee, but also the additional uh, charges that will make up what's known as the TER or total expense ratio. Um, Tony Gilhawley will be uh, delivering some of the modules with me and we will start uh, uh, with the state pension. I think that's the right place to start because that's going to be the bedrock of an individual's uh, retirement income. And the state pension is going through quite a number of changes at the moment, uh, in particular, the way in which an individual will qualify for the state pension. And that's important to get a full understanding of that, to be able to assess an individual's contribution history and to identify exactly what level of pension that they will receive in retirement, both for themselves and also in certain cases for their adult dependent. Um, regulations uh, have always been with us, but in the last number of years, uh, they've become really to the forefront in, in the pensions industry. And I think this week really highlights the significance of regulations and how it will impact us and our clients. Uh, yesterday, IORPS 2 uh, at long last was uh, published and the regulation document runs to over 70 pages. And already the Pensions Authority have come out with a number of timescales for later this year, whereby they will in May give a high level overview of the requirements. They will then issue a draft code of practice and that will be finalized and issued in November. And then in December, uh, they will issue the expectations that they have in relation to master trusts. And I think, you know, as well as the IORP2, which is coming from the EU, the Pensions Authority have a stated objective to reduce the number of pension schemes in Ireland. Um, and they see what, both IORPS2 as the regulation, but also master trusts as the vehicle that will achieve that. And, you know, the pensions landscape is going to change dramatically uh, over the coming months and years as a result of this. Um, in terms of pension solutions, we will look at the different types of pension products um, and go into detail as to the difference between them, be it a standard PSA or a non-standard PSA versus a parcel pension. And again, conscious of the pension simplification agenda uh, that was published uh, early, early, sorry, last, last year by, by, by the government. Um, you know, investment will be covered already in a separate module, but what we will look at in the retirement planning module is investment through a pension lens. And what I mean by that is looking at, in particular, the different default strategies uh, that are uh, used in group pensions. And one of the questions and challenges is why, when there is investment choice within a group pension scheme, do we end up with 80, 85, 90 percent of members in, in the default investment strategy? Um, as well as investment choice, uh, another fairly recent theme, but is uh, really going center stage, is the whole ESG concept, environmental, social and governance. Um, and we'll look closely and examine closely how ESG will need to be incorporated into our pension advice. Um, and that's been driven again by regulations coming from the EU, but it's also been driven by uh, our clients who are becoming much more aware of issues such as climate control, uh, water, etc. Um, and then on the journey to retirement, we will look at the different events that can, you know, make changes to an individual's circumstances. And again, wh why the advice is so crucial and important to give them. Uh, two examples of that will be, you know, when an individual leaves service, uh, do they leave the pension pot where it is? Do they transfer it to their new employer pension fund or do they transfer it to a personal retirement bond? Um, the other, perhaps uh, more traumatic event is, uh, you know, marital breakdown. And increasingly what we're seeing is as a result of more marriages uh, finishing, uh, that, that the pension fund is being brought into the equation and we have pension adjustment orders. And we look at those in terms of pension uh, adjustment orders vis-a-vis -vis the retirement fund, contingent pension adjustment orders vis-a-vis -vis the life cover, and also this interesting concept called a nil pension adjustment order, which seems irrelevant but is quite important because uh, part of the nil adjustment order means that the estranged spouse cannot come back at a later date and challenge and look for a share of the pension fund at that stage. And then the, the final part of the process is to look at the individual at retirement. Um, and one of the things that I have found over the years is that the crucial part 
as well as building up a fund over the years. But the crucial part uh, of the journey is the last stages, getting an individual ready for retirement. Uh, you know, are they in the right fund? When are they likely to retire? And again, that will pull back in the state pension entitlement, give an overall picture. Uh, and we look at the different types of, of retirement benefits. And in particular, uh, you know, I, I'm still a fan of annuities, despite the fact that the rates are very low. But it really is a case of horses for courses. And in some situations, uh, the annuity is the right thing to do. And I suppose one of the benchmarks that I use is, you know, if you have a joint life annuity, uh, and the income continues until the second debt, you know, is that not what pensions are all about? Against that, we have, you know, obviously the ARF argument, which is uh, becoming more and more, I suppose, convincing, particularly as annuity rates are so low. Uh, but we will look at all that, and we will also look at, obviously, the, the caps, the maximum benefits that, 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 that can be built up and taken at retirement. So I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I'd like to wish you all well uh, come this September as you start your module. And I look forward to talking to you again uh, September 12 months. Thanks, Paul. Great stuff. Thanks very much, James. And uh, the final module then is the integrated financial planning module, uh, which is the second module that, that I will take. Um, and, and this really is a capstone module. So what it does is it, it brings together the learning that you will have undergone on the previous five modules and it's applied. Uh, so everything about module six is application. Uh, um, and, and the new learning such as it is, is to do with uh, processes, uh, techniques of analysis and synthesis and ability to be able to take complex situations, analyze them properly, uh, coming out with reasoned conclusions that are adequately supported by um, relevant and appropriate technical analysis. So, so ultimately, that's where the journey is going to finish. Um, and you, you will see there the learning outcomes uh, for this module on the screen uh, in front of you, which, which describe what I've, what I've just mentioned. We will use Excel to a greater extent uh, as part of this particular module. Um, if we could jump to the next slide, please. Um, in terms of the assessment, just to, to, to uh, stress this one, this module will be slightly different to, to all other modules in that there will be um, definitely a, a midterm exam, which is in the form of a case study, a written case study, which is a mirror of the CFP exam itself. OK, uh, and I'll give more detail of that come the time, but that effectively is, is a midterm assessment. And then there's what I call the project, which is a detailed uh, integrated financial plan, quite a, 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 an intensive undertaking. Um, and there's a, a time commitment of approximately 100 hours across eight weeks to develop and furnish this particular uh, financial plan. It's, it's quite complex. Um, you'd need to be able to use Excel and Word, uh, again, not at, at, at a, uh, other than at a business level. So um, nothing to do with writing macros or anything of that nature, but um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's something um, uh, to keep in mind, I suppose, when you get there. It's probably, I'd have to say, uh, in equal parts, the most enjoyable in many respects, part of the program and the most painful. Uh, uh, and I think the enjoyment only kicks in when you're finished uh, and you look back on it, uh, if that makes some sense. The, the going, going through it is, is challenging uh, and there's pressure comes on when you are a week out and you haven't put in the hours that you ought to have put into the project uh, and, it, and it just becomes it just becomes intensive um, but anyway uh, I don't want to sell you on negatives I will genuinely say if you speak to those uh, uh, in your peer group that have gone through it I think you'll find it is the module that that is that sort of brings it all together and makes it happen for for most people and 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 sets you up for uh, for progression into the into the profession um, I, I can't remember if I have another slide there, Aoife, uh, or if that's, if that's it. No, okay. Um, can I just maybe just touch on, on two, two things that I just saw in the questions, and I'll hand over to you, Eva, just to, to moderate that, please. Um, somebody put in a question about uh, going on to a degree. Can, can I just stress, I think the language is confusing. Th this is a postgraduate level qualification, so it's master's level. Level nine is master's. Uh, level seven and level eight are degree level. So... So this is a master's level qualification. Um, so you need to understand coming into it, you'll need to roll up the sleeves from day one. There are, you know, 
depending on backgrounds, but but almost irrespective of backgrounds, you are not going to coast through this. Um, so so please don't come with that attitude in mind. Uh, you'll find from day one you, you'll need to be you'll need to be doing a bit of work on it. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is to do with my mention of maths and does that remove people who are not uh, uh, mathematically minded? What what I would say is I've I have had all sorts on the program. Um, and it's more challenging for, for you if you don't have some sort of mathematical capability. I need to be honest here, it's finance we're dealing with, maths is at the heart of it. So you're going to, you're going to have to be able, I'm, I'm not talking about complex formulas, I need to stress that this is not about complex formulas, but it's about understanding you know, your basic maths functions, but being able to identify trends in numbers is as much a part of it as anything else. Uh, I'm certainly not going to be introducing a whole pile of formulas that you will have to learn off by heart and apply. That's, that's not what this is about. It's what you would do in practice in terms of, for example, being able to calculate target funds for retirement, uh, working back to what contributions might be necessary to meet those targets target funds and so on and so forth. So it's that type of technique uh, uh, in terms of ability to do it rather than focusing on the formulas themselves, if that makes some sense. But Eva, that, that's it from me. I might hand back to you if uh, if, if you would mind for, for the questions, please. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks, thanks, Paul. And just to say thank you to the lecturers for providing an insight into each of their modules. And I hope that that gives everyone a little bit of an insight into what to expect from this master's level program. Um, I suppose just um, touching on what Paul said, like this program equates to two thirds of a master's and a full master's can be achieved um, on completion of three further modules, which we hope to launch in September of 2022. Um, just to let everyone know that we will follow up with all attendees um, here today with a recording of this webinar and with further details on the enrolment process should you wish to progress. And just in terms of the enrolment um, timeline, early applications are encouraged um, and the close off will be mid-August. You will also see on screen our contact information. So if you have any questions, you can contact us by email, phone or live chat via our, our website. So we'll now, this is time some left, we're just going to go through some of the questions that we have coming in. And as I said earlier, if we don't get to any of your questions, we will follow up with you um, afterwards. So um, first question is, um, I might give this one to you, Bill. Um, we have one asking, would a law degree be sufficient? So um, they have a law degree and a QFA with two years experience. Okay, thanks, Aoife. Um, I suggest that we just consider each of those on an individual basis. So if you want to send the information in uh, to Eva, we will look at it and we, we mainly talk to IT Sligo. Um, so if that's okay, that's the first time I've been asked that particular question. So rather than try to answer it on the hoof, um, it, you know, if you send them your details into Eva and we'll get back to you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Um, and then some questions around, like, have the days and times of the lectures been set yet? So they haven't been set yet. We're still in the process of finalising them and they should be finalised shortly. So we should have them available um, by the time you are applying um, for, for the programme. Um, another question is in relation to um, maybe Paul, you might know this one. Is there an element of group project or assignments, or is it predominantly individually assessed? Let me come off mute. Sorry. Um, yeah, listen, I, I, can I just say the assessment re really will rest with each of the lecturers as to, as to how they feel it ought to be best uh, assessed. Uh, what I, to, the, to my knowledge, it is all individually assessed. I, I'll, I'll throw it open to any of the lecturers if they want to come in and and, and change my <laughs> my understanding of that. But I do think everybody assess, assesses on an individual basis. I, I will stress that the project at the very end, um, I will organise you into groups for the purpose of working through the project. It's a support mechanism rather than a collaboration in, in the sense of copying each other. And, and again, I will, I will explain the rules of how that will work come the time, but it, there's, there is certainly collaboration and, and group involvement throughout, I think it's fair to say, but from an assessment point of view, everything that I do and that I'm aware of from the other lecturers is individually assessed. But as I say, if any, if any of the lecturers want to comment that it might be different for their modules, please feel free. Great. 
Thanks, Paul, for that. Um, um, another question is in relation to payment. Um, do module fees have to be paid um, upfront? So essentially, you will only be paying for um, your modules on a term by term basis. So you'll be paying for one or two modules, depending on what you're taking each, each term. You won't be you won't have to pay the, the full program um, payment um, upfront. I hope that answers that question. Um, in terms of, let me see, any other questions? Um, Paul, you might be familiar yeah. around like the, the time commitment um, for, for the modules. Do you have an estimate of what that would look like? Yeah, uh, and, and this, this, is the, this is a perennial uh, uh, thorny question. What, what I would say hand on heart and uh, in all honesty is, for example, if I take the pensions uh, uh, module and without, without knowing James's contents, so <laughs> maybe a, a caveat up front, but I think if you, if you uh, operate to a high level within the pensions arena, it's fair to say that module then would not be as taxing for you as some of the other modules might be. And that applies like equally if you're in a, an investment uh, background, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but if you're coming to it and you're, you, you know, your, your, your level of experience is QFA um, with, with no real uh, uh, specializations across any of these topic areas, I think it would be fair to say you would need to be uh, setting aside 10 hours a week uh, for, for the work that's associated with each, each module. So there's a bit of preparation before you come to the lecture. There's the lecture itself, but there's inevitably going to be work that comes out of that uh, uh, for most people in terms of the lecture itself going back over material to understand the nuances, there's readings involved, et cetera, et cetera. So as, as a guide, that, that's roughly where, where we, tend to, we tend to pitch it. Great, thanks, Paul. There's a few questions coming in in relation to the lectures. Will they be in evenings, weekends, how many there will be? So each module, there will be 12 lectures and the lectures will be held one evening um, a week. So um, just to try and I suppose, suit the majority we know majority of people that will be taking this course will be working full time so to facilitate those people as well um, another question is I'm currently doing the LIA the SIA exams and am I exempt from the asset management module so um, if you are currently sitting the asset management module at the moment you will be exempt from the investment management module which is under the postgraduate diploma um, any other questions then? Um, just in terms of the clarification on the requirements and Bill, I might bring in here. Um, so someone is saying, do do you need a do you need a degree um, and the QFA, or is it one or the other? No, you don't need a degree. If you have the QFA and three years experience in life assurance, banking or financial services, that will meet the requirement. So if you're a QFA with three years experience as, as outlined, that will enable you to do the postgraduate diploma. Brilliant. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that, Bill. I think that answers the majority of questions, um, unless there's any that anyone else can see that I haven't covered. And as I said, um, if there are any questions that we haven't got to um, during this time, we will follow up with you um, afterwards to, to answer any, any other questions that, that you might have. So I just want to say thank you again to everyone for tuning into this information session and thank you to our lecturers. And if you have any questions, um, please reach out and please contact us. Thank you.